All right. Well, it seems our number of joining attendees has stabilized, so we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum, and it's my great pleasure tonight to welcome you all to another of our webinars. Uh, during the coronavirus impacted closure of the museum. Uh, tonight we are welcoming Brad Pilgrim, who is a fixture in the Warbird community. Many of you have likely seen his Facebook posts or at least been impacted by research that he's done into either the B-29 or the B-24, uh, two particular areas of specific interest for him. Uh, that being said, Brad is a Warbird polymath, having uh, restored an award-winning Corsair uh, that featured, uh, showed really well at Oshkosh one year. Um, Brad is uh, uh, currently the uh, assistant director of maintenance at the Kavanaugh Flight Museum, uh, though he has been uh, furloughed uh, because of the coronavirus. So we do all wish him a speedy return to work uh, after the virus has abated. Brad grew up with warbirds uh, in Texas, so had a lot of exposure to the commemorative Air Force and in those days, the Confederate Air Force. Uh, but he was also a loadmaster on C-17s and C-130s uh, in the Air Force. And uh, having worked with Brad at one time, I can tell you that some of his C-17 stories are every bit as incredible and amazing as these B-24 stories he's going to share with us this evening. So let's turn it over to Brad and hear a little bit more about the care and feeding of a B-24. Brad? Hey, Keegan, I appreciate y'all having me on. Uh, like he said, I'm a, I'm a Warbird guy. I've been lucky to do that for most of my life after I retired from the Air Force. Uh, the sole reason I stayed in the Air Force for all those years, other than it was really fun, was I basically wanted to ensure that I was able to play with warbirds for a living whenever I grew up and retired. So that's what I've been able to do. So tonight, this is going to be over the life and time of the world's oldest B-24 Liberator, which is Diamond Lil, belonging to the Commemorative Air Force. Now, this is not intended to be an overall history of the B-24 you know, or the different models. This is a story about a very specific airplane, this particular B-24, and it's an attempt to get the, the true story told about this airplane. There's a lot of people who um, just do not understand this airplane, do not understand where it came from, how it came to be, what it really is. Uh, the CAF is is part of the own, their problem with, with it because they've never... Uh, they've never really put all the research into form where you could actually access it. They've never really uh, corrected the misstatements very often. Another problem, quite honestly, was the Collins Foundation. They've made a living for over 20 years going around saying they've got the last liberator or whatever, and none of that was ever true. I don't blame the, the, the crew of the Collins Foundation. They're all good folks, and a lot of them fly for both organizations. It's just, uh, I guess it's just business at the end of the day. Uh, in the beginning, the XB-24 first flew on the 29th of December of 1939. The Army Air Corps ordered seven examples of the YB-24 prior to the fir first flight, and that order was revised to also include 38 B-24As. The YB-24 is the production version of the test aircraft. The French needed aircraft, bombers specifically, and they ordered either 120 to 175, depending on what source you use, in June of 1940. And the British asked for 135 to 164 of them in June, uh, later in June of 1940, because they knew that France was not going to last long against the Germans and that the UK would be the next target. The French surrendered, as we all know, uh, June 22nd of 1940, and the first Liberators built at San Diego were for the RAF. The first six of the seven YB-24s meant for the Army Air Corps ended up with the British as the LB-30A slash Liberator 1. LB-30 is simply the the uh, you know the version of the aircraft that's being exported. Serial numbers for the British AM258 through 263 never had U.S. serial numbers allocated to them. Technically speaking, only one YB24 was built for the Army Air Corps in May of 41. The remaining six went on to serial numbers at least went on to become the first six B24Ds. The first LB30A arrived in the UK on March 14th of 41. These aircraft lack, lack self-sealing fuel tanks, armor didn't have much in the way of defensive weapons. The RAF relegated them to a transport role, ferrying crews to the US and, and uh, to Canada. What does an LB-30 look like? And I know this all sounds like mumbo jumbo right now, but I, it'll all make sense here in a little bit. Um, what does an LB-30 look like? Well, that's, that's an LB-30 right off the assembly line. That's actually one of the A models. So you can see it basically looks like a B-24 with a short nose and a lack of turrets. The RAF initially sent the coastal, their B-24s or their LB-30s to the Coastal Command for Long Range U-Boat Patrol. 
Some are redesignated as the Liberator GR1 with the air-to-surface radar and four 20 millimeter cannons underneath the bomb bay in a pod, and some had stub wings so you could have up to eight three-inch rockets on them. From June of 41 to December of 43, 120 Squadron was credited with sinking five U-boats and damaging four. Three of those sinkings were by the same airplane. And some of the airplanes were used by the Ferry Command, and none of the 19 out of that original 20, none of that 19 that made it to the UK survived today. Um, the Ferry Command, what they were doing is whenever airplanes were being ferried over to the UK by Canadian pilots or US pilots or even some British pilots, these liberators that weren't being used for sub patrol were going and carrying them back to Canada and to the US so they could pick up more airplanes. So they were just making round robin trips. This is what a GR Mark I looks like. This is AM910. And uh, you can see it's got the antenna array on top and then the gun pod down in the belly of it. And, other than that, it's basically the same airplane that left. You can see the bomb bays on it, but it's other than the, the same airplane that left left the U.S. Uh, the, remember the 38 B-24As that were for the Army Air Corps that I mentioned earlier? Those serial numbers there, 2349 through 2377, were allocated to those airplanes. 2369 through 2377 became nine RB-24As for the Army Air Corps. R means restricted. What that meant was they were not they were not suitable for overseas service in, in combat. Uh, serial numbers 40, 23, 49 through 2368 were released for purchase by the British. These B-24s that went to the UK as LB-30s originally, they were not Lend-Lease airplanes. They were actually purchased and paid for in cash by the UK. Lend-Lease came along afterwards. Uh, the 20 airplanes of that order that were given to the RAF were serial numbers AM-910 through 929. 927, which is Diamond Lil, was the 18th airplane out of the order of those 20. So Diamond Lil is actually the 25th airplane built, if you count the pre-production airplanes, the X model and all that. So Diamond Lil is the 25th airplane built. The US serial number 40-2366, along with the other 19 serial numbers not used by the RF, were later allocated to B-24Ds. B-24As, what happened to the B-24As that were going to the Army Air Corps? You can see there that most of them went into the Ferry Command due to being inadequate, like I was saying earlier, being restricted. This one particular in 2371 was pulled back for reconnaissance work and became the first B-24 destroyed in enemy action when it was destroyed at Pearl Harbor. And then 2270 was destroyed in Australia following the Japanese attack there in March of 42. 2374 carried Arvor Harriman to uh, Moscow in 1941 for the big Lindley's conference that happened there. This is what a B-24A looks like. You know, I said there's LB-30s, then there's the B-24A. Well, this is basically the same airplane. This is what they look like later in life when they were stripped. You see it's got the little short nose on it. You can see the waist windows closed, the bomb bays there in place. Um, it looks kind of like your standard B-24 with the short nose on it. They look basically the same, don't they? It's the paint's nearly the same. The difference being that the U.S. airplanes, they painted black all the way up the side, which we did later in Vietnam with the B-52s and C-130s. But other than that, that's that's essentially the difference in the airplane, which is important to remember. Because the LB-30 and the B-24 are the same airplane. Most of the LB-30, or a lot of the LB-30s ended up converted to transports, and uh, but they all left the factory as fully configured bombers. The only thing not on them were the guns because those had to be added out of the country due to the you know neutrality act and stuff like that. It's important to remember LB-30 does not mean cargo plane. It means B-24 built for export. The big difference is in the B-24A and the LB-30, B, the weapons caliber. The British used 303s versus us using the 30 cal and the 50 cal. The Spiri bomb sight versus us using the Norden sight. The bomb shackles and release were different because the U.S. used double point releases. You have two shackles on each bomb. The British used just one. The radio system, the U.K. used Bendix commercial air, uh, in, uh, radios, and the U.S. used government furnished equipment from the Signal Corps. There's two different styles of autopilot and high pressure versus low pressure, the oxygen system. The paint scheme, which I already mentioned, and the data plate. That's essentially the differences in the B-24A and the LB-30. How does Diamond Lil fit into all this? AM-927, which is this airplane, was accepted by the RAF on May 17th of 41. It was delivered to TWA at Kansas City, Missouri on May 20th, 1941. 
And then it went from there, like like three days later, it went to the Eagles Nest Flight Training Center in Albuquerque. And what happened there was TWA had been contracted to set up a school to do multi-engine conversion and celestial navigation training. That was for the RAF, and that was also for uh, some Americans later on, but it started out as for the RAF. That's why we're using their airplane. This is, there was a landing accident with this airplane on the 24th of July of 41, and, and I won't read the whole thing, but what it amounts to is they landed, and uh, on short final, they pumped the brakes like you always do for the checklist, and when they landed, the right wheel, the right brake was still locked, and it drug the airplane off the side of the runway, folded the right gear off, actually tore the right gear out is what it did, but then the nose gear collapsed, and they said that when it was finished, it looked like a bulldozer had been through there because the dirt was all churned up. There's landing gear scattered everywhere. All the bomb bays and the belly were all torn out of the airplane. This is where it all gets kind of wild with this particular airplane. Most planes in that condition would have just been scrapped out. But 927 was, re was repaired in Albuquerque and ferried back to, con to Consolidated at San Diego sometime in December of 41. Consolidated put in a bid to repair the airplane for the RRF and return it to service for $80,000, but for some reason the bid was never acknowledged. I've got all the paperwork for where the bid was submitted, and then a, a letter later on where they retracted their bid like two years later, but for some reason the bid was never acknowledged. Consolidated began building the airplane back as a totally one-off transport for company use with the intent of backfilling it with another airframe for the RF. That actually never happened. They were building B-24s so quickly that the RAF just, they just never got another one. They could have, it just never happened. Uh, 927 was placed back in service for Consolidated around the 12th of July of 1942. And it was operated on loan by the British Purchasing Commission until formally transferred to Consolidated at the end of the war in November 7th of 45. And what Consolidated was doing with it is they were using it as a factory transport for personnel, for executives, for parts, technical uh, help, things like that. They actually had two airplanes. They had this one and they had another one. It was AL610. And those airplanes were being used to go all over the country delivering parts and technical data. Um, it was not, 927 was not a fancy airplane at the time. It was strictly util utilitarian on the inside with, you know, metal floors, green, green walls, and military seats. This is how Diamond Lil was built. She is one of those airplanes sitting out on the ramp there in uh, San Diego. We can't tell which one. Um, you see in the back row, you see some that are already completed, but up here in the front row, you see the ones that are not completed yet. Uh, you see the life raft hatches open on top and they still have the short noses. And the second one from the, from the right, or the second one on the right, you see the tail sticking out between the two noses. You can see the open tail position, which is, indicates an early model B-24. This is them in production. Here on the back of the fuselage up on top, right forward of the waist window, you see that tarp cover in the top. That is where the top gun was at the time. It was not, you'll, you'll see later in some other pictures, but it was not a turret like you think of with the B-24. It was an open, open window. You slid a panel back and you stood up in there and you had a scarf ring like on an SBD Dauntless and you had a single cal uh, 50 cal machine gun that you stood up and fired out in the open air. That's how that's how the turret was originally on a B-24A. One of these, this is inside the factory. They were built inside and outside. One of these is Diamond Lil. We just don't know which one. Some people say it's the third one back here in the center, but I couldn't swear to it either way. But you can see the gunner's hatch is opened back there behind the uh, life raft hatches. Now, these pictures here are not necessarily Diamond Lil. This, these, I believe, are the B-model Liberator that was being converted later on to a transport. But this kind of shows you how it was repaired after the landing accident uh, in, in, in Albuquerque. This is here in San Diego, and you can see the belly skin laying there. What they did is they removed the entire bomb bay, the bomb bay doors, the bomb rack, all of the supporting structure, and they put in what was called a canoe. And you see this entire section going up inside the airplane and being riveted in place. That became a structural part of the airplane. You can see they already have the windows above there and everything. That's where you carried people and cargo. There was, there was up to 14 seats in the bomb bay in the aft section of the airplane. This is another picture of on the outside. Like I said, this is not necessarily, I, I know this one here is not Diamond Lil because of the bubble windows, but this is 
indicative of how they were built and how it was repaired. You can see the massive work going into the side, converting this one into a transport from a bomber. After the rebuild, this is what Diamond Little looked like. Uh, it was You can see on the tail fin, you can barely see it in yellow back there, but it says AM927. That number stayed on it because it was a it was a British airplane. It still wasn't owned by the U.S. 402366, which is the American serial number that was supposed to be for that airplane, had already been put on another B-24, on a D-model B-24 at this point, so that number wasn't available. So they left AM927 on it. This is what it looked like a little later towards the end of the war when they when they uh, shortened the, uh, or when they stripped the paint off of it, but it still has the short nose on it. Um, during the war, the, the, the end of the war, there was a final conversion that was done to the airplane that was kind of the last thing Consolidated did to it. They put the nose of an RY-3, which is a single tail Liberator Navy, uh, kind of the PB-4Y, the Navy version. It's a nose off of one of those. That was put on the galley, the stove, the ice box, the lav, 14 table uh, seats, tables, all that kind of stuff. PBY QECs, that's the quick engine change kit for the engines. Inspect, uh, ensure the horizontal stab is stressed for 19 Gs. Orders to proceed on this conversion was around the 1st of August of 1945. The PBY QECs, that's that's important to see. Um, you'll see later when I show pictures of the of the engines that the reason these PBY parts are on here versus B24A QECs was there were so few B24As ever built that there were no more uh, spare parts for them by 1945. There was no spare parts, so they had to go to the PBY parts because that was still available. It was essentially a bolt-on conversion to the airplane. The RY3 nose was done because the short nose on the B24 before the first proto before the prototype flew, they knew that had been a bad idea. They said that the short nose was going to make it unstable. It needed to be longer, and that's why immediately after the R the B25A and the LB30B. That's why they immediately went to a long nose. So that's why this airplane was converted. So it brought it up to that standard. This is what it looked like right after that. This is right at the very end of the war. You can see it has the, the nose gear doors that open outwards instead of inwards like the earlier did. You can see it has the V-shaped windscreen and the longer nose that it didn't have before, but you still see, you know, the it's, it's still a transport at this point. Uh, Post-war use of it, on the 11th of October of 1945, there was a, the the British Aircraft Commission saying that uh, you know they were saying that the war is in and we're going to have to get the you're going to have to take the markings off the airplane if we can't have it marked as a military airplane U.S. or British either one because the war is over the rules are changing so in November of 45 the airplane was officially transferred to Consolidated and I have the actual letter that was written from the British Aircraft Commission saying okay it's now your airplane. Then the certification proposal to the CAA, which is the predecessor to the FAA, was done in November. This right here is the application for the for the airworthiness certificate of the airplane. You can see that it shows RLB30 up there as the model, up there in the, the second, third column down, RLB30. That's restricted, meaning that it wasn't capable of going overseas. And you also see that the overhaul was by Pacific Air Motive. And, uh, the dates of it and everything like that. Well, it was Pacific Air Motive because they were right there close to consolidated and that's who was contracted to bring this airplane into civilian compliance. And you can see the date of that was, was uh, April of 1947. This is what the airplane looked like when it first became a civilian airplane. You can see the 24927 is the tail number up there. The AM927 is gone for the very first time. That's the clearest picture I've ever seen of the airplane in that configuration. This is the bill of sale when the airplane was then sold to Continental Can. Continental Can had a couple of different liberators that they used, but you see here the aircraft make is back to LB30 versus RLB30. So that changes a couple of different times over its life. This is in 1946. This is what the airplane looked like then. You can see the, the uh, end number has changed still has the RY3 nose on it. It looks basically like it did. It's just got a really plush interior in it at this point. In uh, May 17th of that year, there was a radar nose added to it. And you can you can see the nose cap. Oops, sorry about that. You can see the nose cap on there. And uh, that was a Chamberlain radome that was actually a, type, a supplemental type certificate for the airplane. 
and uh, that's a Bendix radar that was housed in there. So that was in 1956 that that was that that nose cap was added to the airplane, and it kind of makes a weird shape on the end of the plane. But that's really when it got to be fancy. This is when the Continental Can Company sold the airplane to Pemex, Petroleos Mexicanos. It's the Mexican National Oil Company, and uh, they sold the airplane in 1959 to them. This is what it looked like after Pemex got it. You can see it has the Mexican registration on the back, still has the radar nose. This is what it looked like when the CAF purchased it. You see it gone to green. It has all the flags on there of, of, of you know the countries that it flew to and everything. This is actually taken at Brownwood, Texas. Most people don't realize that. This here, this is two of the original engine cowlings that I have off the airplane. And you can see, I polished these up in the garage one night last year, two years ago. You can see how shiny and, and, and fancy that green was. Uh, we have a surprisingly large number of parts for the airplane that still have the original green, black, and white paint on it. And I used to wonder why we had so many, and I found out later there was about 20 extra engine cowlings came with it whenever they bought the airplane. It was all shipped separately, and this box was full of nothing but engine cowlings and cow flaps and stuff. So I've nearly got enough stuff to build one complete engine assembly with the original paint. I, I would like to do that someday, but who knows. Okay, this brings up to the CAF. You know, the CAF started out to be just, you know, two airplanes, a Mustang and a Bearcat, and they were out racing each other, seeing who was the best fighter pilot. And someone comes along and says, well, what you need is a bomber. And next thing you know, they've got a B-17 and then a B-25 and the A-26. And then they had to have a B-24 because, you know, everybody wanted their favorite airplane. And it's kind of hard to read this letter, but this is December of 1966. And this is from Vic Agather, who a lot of people know as the guy who recovered Fifi from the desert. He paid to have Fifi recovered. He's the guy who spent all the years and way more money than you'd ever imagine getting the airplane recovered and restored. And uh, his family is still high, heavily, heavily involved today. But you see down there in that third paragraph, keep in mind, this is 66. He goes, there's a beautiful C-87 here in Mexico owned by Pemex. They don't want to dispose of it, but if, if they do, it'll come at a very high cost. Their only hope is that it'll be replaced with a modern aircraft at a future date. So this is when the CF first learned about the airplane was in 1966. Well, 1967, and I know Keegan in, enjoyed seeing these pieces of paper when I originally found them. 1967, the CF struck a deal with Pemex to help them find a DC-6 in trade, partial trade for the B-24. In addition, we had to give them back the four engines that came with the airplane because they wanted those four engines for their C-47s because it's the same style engine. Well, they got the airplane. You can see here the date, 1967. Pemex delivered the airplane up to up to Brownwood, Texas, and they went out to eat. And you can see the bar tab and everything else paid for by the CAF. This is all for the Pemex crew that brought the airplane in. And... Uh, the the deal was the CF didn't want to let go of the four engines because they didn't have any more engines to put on it. And so they worked it out to where if they could give them two zero time engines and two cores for a total of four engines, but two zero time flyable engines and two that could be overhauled, then they would consider that a trade. So what they did was they said, when y'all give us the engines, we'll give you the paperwork for the airplane. So you can see here we actually had the airplane in 1967. This is the letter where they're talking about, uh, this is part of the letter, I don't know where the other half is, where they're talking about you know, trading a DC-6. I don't know that the D-66 deal ever happened. Um, I don't really know, the CF never said nothing else about it. This here, don't get upset if you're offended easily, but this is the uh, telegram that was sent April 21st in 1967 from Lefty Gardner to Lloyd Nolan. It says, B-24 mission completed, aircraft secured, Pemex aviators received, deceived, and relieved. Mask of mechanics and tools entombed in engine crates and shipped back to Mexico City. Due to heroic negotiation on the part of the first bomb wing, all engines are still in place. Bomb wing triumphs for fighter wing falters and fails. What that meant was they had managed to talk the guys out of leaving with the engines so that they still had them on the airplane. Well, it took until 1968. This is, this is the register of the bill of sale to the CAF from Pemex for the airplane, you can see it didn't happen until May of 1968. So that's when people assumed the CF acquired the airplane. 
because that's when the title was legally transferred. But we actually had it in 67. We just didn't have the money to buy the engines. So they had to wait till they raised some. And they literally went down to the border crossing and traded the engines for all the paperwork that went along with the airplane. So that's kind of the story of how the CF wound up with it. This is what it looked like. They left it in PMAX colors and, and just wrote Confederate Air Force down the side of it and then later put a Confederate flag on the tail. Um, at the time, everybody said they didn't know when you got in the airplane if you should be wearing a flight suit or a tuxedo because it was extremely plush on the inside. Uh, it was a very nice airplane. It was it was uh, you know luxurious for the time frame. It was basically you know a, a piston powered Learjet at the time. It had very updated avionics, still had the radar, all that kind of stuff in it. You can see over here on the right and the lower. You can see the interior. Of, it's not a very good picture. You can see the interior of it. It was pretty plush. And this is when the CAF was going to take the B-24 up to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio for an air show. It was the first time the CAF had ever gone anywhere with the airplane. And I think this was in 1968, right after right after the airplane had, had uh, been licensed by the CAF. You can see up in that top picture of the Confederate flag on the tail fin. 1971, they started repainting the CAF airplanes into military colors. And there's a guy in San Angelo, Texas named Charlie Day who all these airplanes are painted here, he's the one who did that. And you can see Diamond Lil on the top right, that's what they painted her into. It's uh, you know African scheme basically from the Plesti uh, raid. I can't remember the bomb group, 98 bomb group or whatever it was. That's where it, where it came from. The name Diamond Lil, there's been a lot of people trying to figure out where it comes from. Some people say it's the name of a prostitute that worked up in a town in Oregon. But everybody that I've talked to who's around back in these days say that there was a there was a play and I can't remember Mamie Van Doren or some some well-known pinup played a character in this play about, you know, about a, a uh, house of ill repute in the old west. And she was the madam and her name was Diamond Lil. And it was actually turned into a movie later on. Everybody seems to agree that that's where the, the name actually came from. It wasn't actually from a madam in a house of ill repute it was from this movie it was a character but that's supposedly where it came from the nose art was inspired by the vargas nose art and this particular one i believe was out of a 1969 edition of playboy this is where the art had to have come from and it's certainly the art that we've based it on since then so this is uh this is about the second iteration of nose art on the b24 when it was still painted in the tan and blue um over the years, it was repainted a couple of times, sometimes a little better than others, sometimes not as nice. In 1981, May 1st of 1981, the radar nose was finally taken off and this D model nose was installed on the airplane. And that nose came by way of Dave Talashe. It was in a bunch of stuff that he had gotten up in Canada. He had gotten a two it remains of two B-24s and a bunch of other parts apparently. And it had all been brought in on a railroad to California. And a lot of it suffered in damage or whatever, but the CAF traded a gun nose for a P-38 for the bomber nose for the B-24. And so it was installed on the airplane in 1981. That's really the first time they made any effort to return the airplane to any kind of military configuration. So how do you go about backdating the B-24A to an LB-30? That's what the idea was. There was, you know, the CAF was having all kind of trouble in the in the early 70s with people coming to visit the airplane and having to pay two dollars to tour it and then them getting mad and write letters to headquarters saying you know i flew b-24s in the war that's not a b-24 i don't know what kind of airplane it is but it doesn't have the gun turrets it doesn't have bomb bays it's fancy on the inside so there was a lot of trouble with it and that's kind of where nobody really knew what an lb-30 was uh nobody really knew what a b-24a was they just knew this didn't look like your standard b-24 so I can't remember the exact year. I want to say around 2005 or something like that. We started converting the airplane as close as we could back to a LB-30B slash B-24A configuration. You can see the nose art was taken off. This whole thing was ramrodded by a guy named Gary Austin, who was a really good friend of mine. And he was the crew chief for the B-29 and B-24 squadron at the time. Back then, Fifi had been grounded for couple of years at this point because we had lost you know we didn't have any more good engines to use we didn't have the money to get the new engines on the airplane that we have on there today so the airplane was kind of stuck so they spent money to convert diamond lil back in order to make it a little more popular and try to make a little more money off of it this all happened down in midland texas when cf headquarters was there some things just can't be changed 
it's all time and money. That's what it takes to convert a B-24, you know, back to a B-24 from a executive transport. The nose, the nose will probably never change. You can see on the left, the little short B-24A nose, that was not a good idea to begin with and no one ever liked it and it changed in production later. Well, the way the nose is scabbed on the Diamond Lil, it was done at the company on the factory jigs. So you really couldn't, even if you had a B-24A nose section to put on, it would nearly be impossible to attach it to the airplane without totally changing everything on the front end. So it's just not, a, it's not even a practical idea. So the chances of it ever happening are non-existent. That's one thing that would probably stay. And you would want to change it anyway, due to the fact that they were so unstable with the short noses. And I mentioned earlier, the, the nose on their airplane is actually alpha of an RY3. That's an RY3 on the right. You can see it's the tall tail version of a Liberator. The PB4Y, which is the actual Navy version, is a little different than that. But you see the writing on the, the metal there, RY338, that was actually under the paint uh, on the floor of the B-24 when we started this conversion. So that proved it was an RY3 nose. The engine cowlings. I mentioned earlier that the engines in the QECs were changed over to a uh, PBY system. If you look at it, you see where the exhaust exits out the top, and then it's got the little scoop in the front of the, the carb scoop there in the front, then you see the oil cooler on the bottom. You can see it, the PBY on the right side there, it's the exact same system. Firewall forward, it is a PBY Catalina. This picture here is the original B-24A in uh, exhaust system and all that. If you look, it's kind of hard to see, but there on the side of the cowling where the exhaust streak is, you can see where the exhaust comes out there. That's essentially what the difference is, the location of the oil cooler and where the exhaust comes out of the aircraft. Other than that, the engine, the prop, the cowling is basically the same. So it's really not practical to change that. Even if you could find all the original A model B-24 components, it would be, I don't know that it would even be practical to do it, but that is one thing that maybe you could change in the future. This airplane originally had a flight engineer. Um, he sat on the facing backwards behind the pilot on the left side of the airplane. Um, that entire thing is gone now and the hydraulic system is where that panel was. There's really no need to have that panel there. It would look neat, and we've talked about mocking one up, but to get all that stuff hooked up and wired in would really be uh, more of an exercise than would be practical, so that would probably never be done again. And then the interior. This is what I think is really interesting. On the left, that's AM923, which was built four airplanes before Diamond Lil. It's got the same kind of yokes that the PBY Catalina does. You see the gun sight up in the left corner in front of the pilot. Keep in mind, this is a... British airplane used for sinking submarines, so that was for firing those cannons. But look at the throttle handles. They look totally different than a standard B-24 handle. You can see number three is pulled back, but you can see that they they are like B-17 throttles, if you know what those look like. So if you look around the right, this is kind of an older picture of what Diamond Lil's interior looks like. It's got a little better avionics and stuff now, but the two don't even look alike. We've got the later model B-25 wheels and all that control yokes in there. That was all done by Consolidated. So it would be nice to put PBY yokes back in it maybe someday, but I don't know that that'll ever happen. But you see even the square behind the yokes the, the, where it goes in the instrument panel. On the other airplane, the old one, it's a triangle. See, it's, it's a totally different cockpit on the front because this is an RY3 nose on the airplane. This is one of the more interesting parts that we can, we will be able to fix someday maybe. See right there above those three windows on the side of the airplane right behind the wing? See there's a machine gun sticking out of the top? I said earlier that early model B-24s had a hatch on top with a scarf ring in them. They didn't have a turret like a standard B-24. You can look right there, and this is about the best picture I've ever seen of it and, it, and it's not very clear. But you can see here on the left that that gun is up on the ring outside of the airplane. That's what Diamond Lil originally had. This picture on the right, just in, for, in front of that rail where the antennas are mounted, you see the, the hatch there. That's the hatch that slides forward. On Diamond Lil, when she was converted to an executive plane by the company, that was removed and skinned over completely. You can't even see the outline from the outside. But on the inside of the airplane, the ring is still there where you would mount the scarf ring and all that. So all that is still there. The problem is when it was converted to a transport, all the control cables that used to run down the sides of the airplane, most of them were routed over the roof so that they could put a door in the side. The problem with that is those cables go right over that hatch where that hatch would be. 
So if we were ever able to reroute those control cables, which would be a major deal, we could put that gun back in there. But the ring, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of the ring. I thought I did and I couldn't find it. Um, but the ring to mount that is, is still on the airplane. This is the inside of the bomb bay. You saw in the pictures earlier how it was all put together. This is standing forward looking back. Well, that whole canoe section, that entire floor section, would have to come out and a beam down the center and then your side racks and everything. And you can see the windows there as well. The practicality of replacing that and putting the bomb bay doors back in, the practicality is just not very high. The possibility is high, but so is the cost of doing it. So what we have now, you can see on the on the left, we've got the bomb racks in the airplane. We have bombs hanging in it and everything like that. And it's a good mock-up on the inside, but we don't actually have the doors. On the right side, you can see what the bomb racks and all look like. If you ever look at the Collins Foundation airplane, um, it's fully configured with the bomb bays and all that, but the entire assembly inside there is different from the A model. The early model airplane is a, is a completely different airplane from the later ones. All that being said, we do have most of the bomb bay parts to do this. Those are the doors laying on the left side and the racks and some of the support and assembly on the right. We have a lot of the stuff that it would take to put the bomb bays back in the airplane. What we don't have is the million, million and a half dollars it would take to completely disassemble the airplane, put it in a fixture to hold it, disassemble the belly of it, the main beam, and replace it with all this. So I don't know, maybe it'll get done someday. I would like to think it will, but who knows it's expensive enough just to keep them running nowadays what we were able to do so far again time and money limits what you're able to do the tail of the airplane you can see on the left this is what the tail looked like whenever it was converted to a cargo airplane that was just a just a pod put on the end of it it didn't open up or anything like that they could store stuff back there on the right you can see what it looks like there on the lower end when it was drilled apart up above there you can see what the a model liberator turrets look like. It's just an opening. It just slides open and has a single machine gun that sticks out. Well, this is in progress. This is what they were, you know, Gary Austin, he was such a smart guy. This is what he was doing to, to uh, replicate this. You can see where the tracks are in the side there in the, in the tan. You can see where the tracks for the sliding portion of the doors that come back. But the lower green part, the, the part that's got the zinc chromate primer on it, that's the, the pod that the gun bolts to. And when Gary was trying to build this, he tried two or three times to build something and it just wasn't going to work with the compound curves and all that. And one day we were walking along out there in, in the uh, CF uh, parts building and he found a spinner to a Heinkel that had a big dent in one end of it. I mean, it was it looked like someone ran into it with a golf cart. And what Gary did was he cut that in half and then took the good half, split it down the middle, and bent it to where it fit, and that's what became this gun pod on the back of the airplane. So that's actually a Spanish Heinkel prop, prop spinner that is now where that gun is sitting. Uh, you see up there the, the machine gun on the left side that's installed. There's that canvas seat. That's what you set in in this airplane. You didn't have a turret to set in like people think of. And on the right, you see the guy, dead-eyed Pete there, aiming his gun. You can see the, the door slid back and everything. So that was all replicated on this airplane. That's what it looks like from the outside. The waste windows. That's the waste window of the of the B-24. And then on the right side, you can see where the waste window frame was still there when it was converted to a cargo plane. So what Gary did is he took all that out, opened that window back up, and put a waste window with a waste gun in the right side of the airplane. And this is what it looks like now. We don't have one in the left side because that's where the door is. And we'll get to that in just a second. But uh, so he did put that in there. You can see here on the left, this is Diamond Lil in 1968. Incidentally, that's the B-26 Marauder underneath it just to the right, which is kind of interesting. But you see the big side, the door is open on the side of the airplane. Um, that's why the control cables were rerouted. And that's also where the left side waste window was supposed to be. Well, if you look at this picture on the right side, right behind the landing gear, you see that little bitty hatch in the belly? That's how you got in and out of the B-24A slash LB-30. And so the CF B-29, B-24 squadron made the decision to, instead of converting it back to a left side waste window, they were gonna leave that door in it because that other door on the right was gonna be too hard for elderly people to get in and out of now, you know, and people the size they are nowadays wouldn't be able to get in and out of there. So from a practicality standpoint, 
they left that big side door in it that was added when it became a cargo plane. This B-24, this early model ones, they didn't have a lower turret. In fact, it wasn't until I think midway through the D model B-24 that the ball turret was added on. They had just basically a, a tunnel gun is what they called it. It was a 50 cal that locked into a socket and fired through the belly of the airplane. And you can see on the left, that's what it originally looked like. And on the right, that's where Gary added one in there. The framing was still there from it originally. It had just been all skinned over from when it was converted to a transport. So after that, we decided on a new name and a new paint job to make the airplane a little bit more, you know, a little bit more pizzazz, a little bit more presence. And the, the name and the nose art, old 927, were chosen and painted on by a guy named Chad Hill, who did an, an amazing job on it. Um, the old 927 name, where it came from, was when the airplane was being used by, by Continental, or by Consolidated back and forth across the country to all the Consolidated plants. They referred to the airplanes by their tail numbers. And there's one letter in CF records where someone referred to it as old 927. I don't believe that that airplane was ever known by that because in the Air Force, we referred to airplanes by their tail numbers. And like, you know, if it had two zeros and a four eight, it was balls four eight. And then triple six, if it was three sixes or triple nickel, if it was three fives, you referred to the airplanes, you know, with their pet names by, by the tail numbers a lot of the time. And I don't know that 927 was ever an official or even unofficial nickname. I think it's just something people referred to the airplane to to uh, separate it from AL610, which would have been called old 619, uh, 610. I don't know. But that's that's where the name old 927 came from. That's the nose art on it. And that's uh, what it looked like. We didn't keep that, but just a couple of years, and we changed it back to Diamond Lil. And the reason being... Uh, tradition mostly. Um, the plane had always been Diamond Lil. That's what it was known as. It wasn't famous being a warbird for, you know, f with another name. It was famous for being Diamond Lil. And so the squadron voted to return to that name and new nose art. And we also put the neutrality flags on the side. Big problem was people were always asking us, what happened to Diamond Lil? Where did Diamond Lil go? Did y'all get another B-24? You know, people were saying they'd seen 927 and Diamond Lil at the same place. You know, it just... It was a marketing exercise that didn't work. No one, no one cared that it was called 927. So that's why we went back to 92, uh, back to Diamond Mill. I personally would go back to the pink paint too. I just like that traditional. So this is what the airplane looks like today. Um, we've done what we can to get it back in its original shape. It'll never be exactly what it was, but it doesn't matter what what you do. Someone's going to complain if you convert it from an LB 30B all the way back to a B-24A bomber, someone's gonna say, well, that's not original. So it doesn't matter what you do, someone's gonna be mad. Common misconceptions about the airplane was that it was never accepted by the RF. That is false. We have the supplier's invoice, the exportation doc, uh, declaration, the RAF contractor's advice and inspection note signed by A.R. Blair for the British Purchasing Commission and the aircraft packing list from Consolidated. So that's proof that the airplane was accepted by the RAF. It was never delivered to the RAF overseas, but it 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 did belong to the RAF. And uh, the other one is the biggest one is this, people say it never came out of the factories of transport and it never was a bomber. Even members of the CF general staff and in the past, one of the executive directors even pushed out a policy letter saying that the airplane had been built from the factory as a transport. And that is not the truth. Here's the invoice for the airplane. And uh, you can see right there in the highlighted section, it says LB30 manufacturer serial number 18, uh, RAF serial number AM927. And then down there where the star is, it says supply and install 1232R199 bomb shackles. That there proves, along with the letter describing the accident where the bomb bay doors were torn off, those two things prove that the airplane came out of the factory as a bomber fully configured. What exactly is Diamond Lil? What model is she? She's not a C87. The prototype C87 was the B24D, that's the serial number, 40355, that had a belly landing in Arizona in 1942. It was torn up a lot like Diamond Lil was. Um, but by the time Diamond Lil was finished, Consolidated really liked the idea of this airport. So they took this second B24, that D model, and they converted it to a cargo plane. And that became the prototype for the B24, or for the uh, C87. I think there was 270 of them built or something, but all C87s were built in Fort Worth. Diamond Lil never was a C87. 
She has never been uh, anything but an LB30B slash B24A, at least on paper. Um, she was the prototype for the prototype of the C87. And there's a letter from Consolidated in September of 42 waiting for talking about waiting for a steady stream of transports to come out of Fort Worth. And when that happens, they were going to try to get three or four of the more of the older A models to use for themselves. And then there's this letter, 6 May of 43, saying that the conversion to AM927 was the primary reason for the development of the C87. So it was a very important airplane as far as the development went, but it never was actually a C87. Diamond Lil never was what most people think of as a B-24. It started out as a very early, nearly pre-production bomber. Due to the landing accident, she ended up as a purely one-of-a-kind handmade transport, so successful at that 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 became what the new model of transports were based off of. Um, a big, mo most important thing is LB-30 does not mean transport. A lot of LB-30s were converted later on into transports, but as I said earlier, they all came out of the factory as bombers. LB-30 means land bomber built to export configuration for the UK. That's what it means. Um, Diamond Lil never had the round engine cowl, or uh, never had the oval engine cowlings that people associate with B-24s. It never had the powered tail turret, the top turret that people think of when they think of B-24s. It was always a early model airplane that they were still developing as it was going. Because all you've got to do is Google a picture of an A model B-24 and then a Google a picture of a J model B-24. They're totally different airplanes. Even the fuselage dimensions, as far as the depth of the fuselage and all that, is different. If you have a line drawing side by side, they are different airplanes. Uh, the, the A model really was a basically a pre-production airplane rushed into service for the British. Uh, it never was what people can think of as a B-24. So even if we restored it to the condition it was in the day it left the factory, whether it was British markings or American markings, it still would not look like what people think of as a B-24 other than the double tail fins and the four engines. So I know a lot of that's confusing. I know a lot of the serial numbers and all that kind of stuff kind of jumbled together and I went kind of fast, but it's really an interesting airplane. And I, it's, I think, you know, people have used the word LB-30 over the years, basically in a condescending manner. The Collins Foundation guys do it. Oh, well, that's, that's the LB-30 you're talking about. Well, one interesting thing about it is because the airplane was the first B-24 certified for civilian use. The reason that it has the serial number AM927 instead of the original military serial number, as I mentioned earlier, that those serial numbers that were canceled when they went to the UK, those American serial numbers later wound up on early production D model liberators. The B-24D that wound up with Diamond Lil's original 402366 serial number survived the war and ended up being scrapped later on being used as a trainer but because that serial number wasn't available when the airplane was certified to the to the civil aviation standards they went with the serial number am927 because that's what it still had that's why it was still called an lb30 because that's what was on the paperwork but the interesting thing is, is if you get a top rating in the b24 today whether you fly for collins or you fly for the cf or whoever your license is going to say lb30 because that's what the aircraft is certified as. So you look at an A26, most of the A26s don't have bomb bays on them. Very few of them do. But no one ever says, oh, that's not a, that's not a bomber. But they do that with Diamond Lil because, oh, that's, that's, that's just a transport. That's not a bomber. In essence, she is. Yeah, the bomb bay doors are, are covered over right now, and someday they'll maybe be back. But it is a, it is a very interesting airplane from a military standpoint, from a developmental standpoint, from a historical standpoint. Um, for all these years, it's uh, other than the last couple of years we've been doing maintenance on it, it's never not flown since 1943, 42. You know, there's been about five years since 1942 that the airplane hasn't flown. Other than that, it, it's been in the air. And today it is the oldest multi-engine airplane still flying. So, that's about what I've got to say. Uh, you can see there's the website for the CF for the Air Power Squadron. Uh, of course, the tour is on hold due to the coronavirus and Diamond Lil's having some landing gear work done on her anyway. But if you want more information on the airplane, you can go there. Um, not all the information on there is right. I'm trying to get all that changed. I just uh, got a lot of irons in the fire and eventually I'll get it done. But if anyone's got any questions about anything, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. Well, thank you, Brad, for that awesome exploration. Uh, I think it's a 
great opportunity to see just how much depth there is in each and every one of these incredible historic airplanes uh, that both the CAF and the Military Aviation Museum keep in airworthy condition. Um, you know, we've we've got aircraft here that share that same kind of curious history um, from from the war years and and what basically kept them operational and and out there and accessible even after the war. A um, couple questions. Uh, have been asked so far. If you do have questions, please do put them in the question window just now. Brad, I'll ask you a couple uh, just to give people a chance to do that. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the uh, Bombay doors on a B-24 that not many people know is that how they roll up the outside of the fuselage. Can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, what that would actually look like if installed on the airplane? Yeah, if you, if you look at a B-17 or a B-25 or anything like that, the Bombay doors, whenever they open up, you know, they fare in the belly of the airplane is what they do. Whenever they open up, they are hanging from the bottom of the plane and are extended into the slipstream. On the B-24, they don't do that. And the B-32 Dominator was the same way. The landing gear or the, the uh, Bombay has little electric motors in there that have cogs on them like an ammunition feed motor in a gun turret. And what happens is whenever you open the Bombay doors, those roll and it's basically like a bicycle chain it rolls the doors open and they roll up the side of the fuselage they they actually flex and they go from the belly of the airplane up around the curvature of the fuselage up to the sides so uh there's there's a little bit of a of an airspeed penalty when you open anything on a bomber on a bomber but with them opening sideways like that there's no ground clearance issues or anything because the b24 sets really closely to the ground if you've ever seen one and uh, they could walk into the Bombay nearly from the side versus the B-17 that you had to stand up in it. But basically they roll around the side of the airplane and become part of the side of the fuselage. And then whenever you close them, they roll back down. They never hang out into the slipstream. They just roll back into position and lock shut, just like a bicycle chain. Okay, another question we've got for you here. Um, besides Diamond Lil, uh, how many B-24s are still around? And uh, if you can separate them by flying versus uh, perhaps static. The, I, I think there's about, I don't know the exact number off my head, to be quite honest, but I think there's about 10 or 12 that are what you would consider complete B-24s, you know, displayable B-24s. The CAF airplane is capable of flying. The Collins Foundation airplane is capable of flying. And then Kermit Weeks down in Florida, he's got an absolutely beautiful B-24J, but uh, and it is capable of flying, but it hasn't flown in probably 20 years, but and it needs a lot of work to get it flying. But you could roll that airplane out and have it, you, you could have it in the air in a year. You would need to spend a lot more time to make it really nice, but you could have it flying in a year. Other than that, I think there's about 15 wrecks that are known of. But as far as flying ones, those those three, the CAF, Collins Foundation, and Kermit Weeks, those are the only three that are likely to ever fly again. Okay, and we've got a question here. Um, Consolidated obviously had a major presence in San Diego. Uh, the factory is still there where they built the B-24s. You can go see it. Um, it's now a DARPA facility. Um, there is uh, There is also Consolidated's big facility in Fort Worth, uh, which is near and dear to your heart, uh, you know, being that you're in Dallas. Um, can you talk a little bit about other locations where B-24s were built? Obviously, Willow Run uh, sticks out as, as a major engineering accomplishment during the war. Yeah, B-24s were built. In, they were built in San Diego. They were built in Fort Worth. There was a few built in Dallas. And then Willow Run, like you mentioned, I think there might have been one other. Willow Run was, was Ford Motor Company. And uh, I think if they didn't turn out the most B-24s, they came in second. Um, they they turned out a lot of B-24s. And I believe what they had was assembly lines side by side. So you had airplanes going two at a time down the road or you know down the assembly line and coming out. And uh, I've always heard that the building actually had a left hook to it, you know, left-hand turn, because if it would have kept going straight, it would have gone into another county. And so it had a sharp left turn on turntables where the airplanes didn't change counties. And supposedly that's because Henry Ford didn't like the tax situation of those counties. Whether that's true or not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but the B-24, interestingly enough, to only be two of them flyable and the third possibly flying, 
It was the most produced American military airplane of all time. And it may very well be the most produced four engine airplane of all time. I'm not sure. There was over 18,000 of them built, anywhere between 18,188 to 18,700. But it, it's, it's really kind of sad that out of over 18,000 of them built at four or five different locations, there's so few of them left flying or otherwise. Yeah, you mentioned Dallas. I mean, that was a, a really interesting thing. North American Aviation built them there in Dallas at what uh, later became NAS Dallas. Um, it's really kind of an interesting thing because people typically think that's a typo. They think North American built B-25s, but they did also for a limited period build a handful of uh, B-24s. Um, we've got a question here about the ASW uh, Maritime Patrol versions of the B-24. Um, I think Perhaps the question relates to the flyability or existence of any of the PB4Ys. There is there is one PB4Y that is still flying today, and it's out in Arizona. Uh, some really nice folks own it that are they have been very helpful to Diamond Lil over the years. Uh, really good folks, um, and it's that's basically set up in its last configuration as Coast Guard it, in the Coast Guard. It doesn't have any of the armament on it. Instead of having the turrets into the side, it has the observation windows and all that. And it's a really neat airplane. Um, it came from Hawkins and Powers Aviation out in Montana. They had seven or eight of them they were using as fire bombers. And unfortunately, over 20 years ago, there was a PB4Y that had a wing separation uh, during a firefighting uh, maneuver. And it was something that broke that had been milled into the spar in 1943. It was something that had been there all these years and it finally just chose that moment to fail. So that brought about an end to the PB4Y uh, fire bomber project. So that, that one that they have there in Arizona was sold to those individuals who still operate it today. There was another one that went to the Lone Star Flight Museum down in Galveston, Texas at the time. It's now in Houston. And uh, that airplane was going to be fully restored to military configuration. And it was really in good shape. And they spent a lot of money on it and did a lot of work to it. And unfortunately, that last hurricane got it. And uh, the airplane floated around in 15 foot of salt water. And uh, so that rendered it un unairworthy. It ended up at the Pima Museum out at, uh, at, uh, in Arizona, and they've restored it to static condition, and it's really a nice one. There's that one, and then there's one in, uh, I think, uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan, they've got a PB-4Y. And then uh, the Navy Museum has a PB-4Y that are restored to basically military configurations. But the only one flying is, is that one out there in Arizona. And, uh, you get the chance to see it, go see it, because it's it's a very interesting looking airplane. Being longer than a standard Liberator, plus having that tall single tail and everything. In a lot of ways, it's not even a B-24. It's a totally separate airplane, but uh, it's definitely B-24 lineage. So uh, we've got a fairly, Brad, you, you'll you know this question. Uh, you and I, I think, have answered it probably a hundred times standing under the nose of the airplane. Um, why do you think the B-24 doesn't, get the popularity of some of the other bombers, even though it was produced in such vast quantities? The B-24, um, well, it, it didn't have the publicity machine that Boeing had. That's that's essentially what made the B-17 such a famous airplane. Don't get me wrong, B-17 is a wonderful machine, and anybody who says it ain't a liar, but uh, the B-17 was a publicity monster. It was pushed by Boeing's PR department. Consolidated never really did that. And, uh, you know, they, you, you'll read a lot of times that it was referred to by B-17 crews as the box the B-17 came in. And uh, it just was kind of an ungainly airplane. It wasn't quite as pretty to most people. But basically, it was a PR thing. Um, B-24 was, was an exceptional bomber. Um, it, could fly, it couldn't fly as high as the B-17, but it could carry more for farther and faster, just not as high as the B-17. But it was ever a bit as good. It wasn't quite as 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 you know, tough as far as battle damage absorbing, but that's just because the way the airplane was built. But uh, it's the PR, it's it's a public relations issue. That's why people don't know the B-24 nearly as well. I mean, you do, you hear stories about, you know, the B-17 bases being closer for the uh, reporters to be able to reach them in England and things like that. Um, so even, even down to the origin of the name Flying Fortress, you know, that was a, a press and marketing decision that Boeing made. Um, I think one of the really interesting things about a B-24 is the reason so many were made is it, it really is a statistician's airplane, uh, perhaps more so than a pilot's airplane, um, because it 
carries more bombs it it is more it is a more effective tool at prosecuting the war but it's not necessarily as survivable as as a b-17 either and that's something that that led a lot of crews to kind of scratch their heads about the airplane i think and, and part of the survivability issue with the b-24 was the way the landing gear retracted into the wing it left a really large hole where the gear retracted, where there was no structure in the wing. The spars and all were forward of the wheel well. And so the B-17, the wheels retracted, not vertically, but they space-wise vertically. But so the B-24 had a really large, basically weak spot in the wing. Didn't make it, uh, you know, less strong than the B-17. It just made it a lot less likely to absorb battle damage because it didn't take as much of a hit to tear up that part that was already weakened by design. I mean, much is much is made of the wing. Famously, the Davis wing is one of the few things that is relatively consistent among the Liberators. Um, you know, you mentioned that if you lined up the fuselages next to each other, you'd see they get beefier and bulkier, and the engines change, and they end up carrying thousands of pounds more weight than they were originally designed to. Um, and it's it's one of the things I think that when you see a B-24 in person the first time, you're actually dumbstruck by just how long that wingspan really is. Can you talk a little bit about the wing, Brad? It's basically the same kind of wing the B-29 has. It's got a fairly narrow cord, meaning leading edge to trailing edge. It's fairly narrow. It's really high lift in the center. So it's kind of an odd shape if you stand at the wing tip and look towards the root. But it, uh, you know, the, the design of it was miraculous. It was the first airplane to fly with that particular wing design. But it essentially allowed you to have a higher wing loading on the airplane with less wing space and being able to carry a heavier load. If you look at the B-24 and the B-29 both, they had double bomb bays. So they were built to carry a whole lot more bombs than the B-17 was from the beginning. And that wing is what gave them the ability to carry that kind of load. I had an interesting question here. Um, you know, when Ford took over production, one of the first things that had to happen was consolidated. It's almost hand-built airplane had to be made uh, ready for mass production on a true assembly line. And uh, can you talk a little bit about the quality and uh, quality of parts and interchangeability that that Diamond Lil has with some of the later model Liberators? Like, just how many parts is it really possible to reuse, if any? On Diamond Lil, you you can change more parts with another B24 than you could a standard B24A slash LB30B. The reason being, the airplane has had so many improvements made to it over the years. The entire nose is a later airplane. The interior is 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 stripped. All the military equipment's gone out of it. The landing gear and stuff has been overhauled and changed out over the years. But we found with like the landing gear trunnion, the parts that we're having repaired today, um, there's six different part numbers for the landing gear trunnion. They all look the same. And I think about four of them will actually fit any position, but the other two will only fit one particular airplane. Diamond Lil's got a lot of parts, like some of the hydraulics out of it are actually B-17 pumps and stuff like that, because it's just, it, they just needed a pump to put in it, you know, and that's what got put in. And uh, consolidated when they built the airplane back up as their own personal transport, after the war, they didn't exactly worry about keeping consolidated parts on it. So in some respects, you know, the, the, the engines and engine cowlings and all that, exhaust, none of that's interchangeable with the B-24. The control surfaces, they were, the, the tail control surfaces are all interchangeable. The ailerons are not. The flaps are. Um, the propellers are. Um, uh, the weapons and stuff like that, if you don't count the turrets, that stuff's interchangeable. But a lot, there is still a few pieces in there once in a while that, that are A model pieces that were handmade. And it's interesting in some of the documentation I have for the airplane from Consolidated, its very first mission when it was built in 1942, when it was built in the transport configuration, its very first trip was to go from San Diego out to Fort Worth to talk to the guys here in Fort Worth about building B-24s and making sure that they were getting the stuff they needed from suppliers. And then their second trip was up to Michigan to to figure out how come they were behind. That was the sole purpose that, you know, of, of that trip was to figure out why they were behind on B-24s. So, but once they got everything ironed out and everyone got on the same sheet of music, just like with the Corsairs and any, any airplane that's built by different builders, you're going to have minor differences at the end with like airplanes. But if you get a, a Dash 1A Corsair, Birdcage Corsair, and a F4U-4, 
they're not going to interchange just because of the you know the transition from early model to later model but if you get an f4 u-4 built in two different factories they should interchange fairly well the b24 was the same way all right and uh folks if you have a question do do input it at this time because we are wrapping up the list of questions that have been asked so far and we're just a few minutes over time there is an opportunity to take a handful more questions if you have them um, brad can you talk a little bit about how c87s were actually used during the war c87s um you know it was, it was a purpose-built transport like i said they took they took that crashed airplane from arizona and using what they had learned with diamond lills conversion they built it into a transport they took it to bowling air force base in washington dc and our bowling army airfield and general arnold hap arnold who was chief of the air corps at the time he liked what he saw and he said, buy them, buy them now. And they, like I said, they built 280 of them or whatever it was. And those airplanes, they went all over the world carrying parts and cargo and people and transporting stuff. They flew back and forth over the hump in the China Burma India theater. They carried stuff. You have to think the C 47 was really the only transport we had. And, and then the C 46 later on and then the C 54. But the C 87 was low to the ground, it was easy to load. You didn't have to go uphill like you did in the C-47 and the C-46. So there was a little bit of ease to it. That being said, it wasn't a great performing airplane. Um, they had a lot of trouble with it in China and India where it was so hot and humid where they'd really load those airplanes up heavily with parts and, and people. And uh, they would you know, struggle to get off the ground. And if you read the crash reports from the LB-30s in, in that part of the world, they're, most of them involve a pretty high loss of life because they had them just loaded down with cargo and one of them had 22 people in it. And so it was it was a transport. This is long before the C-130 and the C-5 and the C-17 and stuff like that. Everything that went over the hump into, into China from India, most of it, you know, it all went in airplanes early in the war, but most of it came in, in, in LB-30s or in C-87s. LB-30s had been convert, converted to cargo. Um, later B-24s were converted to the C-109, which is a flying gas tank, and those were not popular with the crews at all from the guys I've talked to, but the B-24 did basically every every mission that a, that a multi-engine airplane could do, and the hump missions would have been a lot harder in that part of the war, would have turned out quite a bit different had they not had the C-87 for that mission. All right, and uh, on to the sort of multi-role and unusual mission category for B-24s. Uh, this will be our last question for the evening, Brad. Um, it relates to the closing of the Mid-Atlantic Gap uh, using B-24s as long-range patrol airplanes. Uh, was it kind of an always intended function for the B-24 to have this, uh, you know, maritime utility, or was it uh, something that it kind of accidentally found it, it's, you know, one of its callings doing? I think it wound up mostly being a function of the range. The airplane was designed to be long range because that's what you wanted was the ability to go a long way and drop a bomb on someone. But just like a PBY, anything with a long range suddenly becomes great at maritime use because you can go out and loiter. And there were, you know, some of the, the British, when they had the LB-30s that they were using for their submarine patrol, they would put bombs in the back bomb bay and fuel tanks in the front bomb bay, and they could stay airborne for 16 hours. And that's that's an awful long time to stay in one of those airplanes and do that. But, you know, when you design an airplane, you design it for multi-use. You design it for every single thing. You know, you make a design and then you you tweak it to meet every single contingency that you could possibly think of, from aeromedical evacuation to tanker in to long range, you know, reconnaissance, photography, all these kind of things that the B-24 did. And so I don't think it was designed solely with the idea of, hey, we can go do this long range you know, scouting mission. It just wound up, hey, you need a plane to do the long range scouting? Guess what? This thing can fly 16 hours. Oh, that's great. So I think it, it kind of wound up being, it just kind of fell into that position. I don't think it was built that way. It just was one of those things that it was such a great flexible design that it ended up working well for that particular mission. Excellent. Well, that concludes uh, the sort of active flow of questions, and uh, you've answered all of them, Brad. So uh, thank you very much again for your time this evening and for spending it with us and sharing the incredible story of Diamond Lil. Um, we hope to have you back at some point to uh, share some of your new research and findings on the history of the CAF's B-29. I'd be happy to. I appreciate you having me on. Alrighty, and uh, that does conclude our presentation for this evening.
Again, I'm Keegan Chetwin, the director of the Military Aviation Museum. That concludes our program for this evening. Thank you all so much for attending, and we look forward to being able to uh, hopefully have Brad down here and host him at the museum and have him come take a look at some of our project airplanes.